Do you believe in dreams? I started as a wannabe filmmaker with a $500 camera I bought at Walmart. I didn't go to film school. I didn't even have any technical background in cameras. What I had was a passion for storytelling and an innate willingness to take big risks. I was also fortunate to learn from people who were way better at this than me. And I was good at being a rookie and asking an absurd amount of questions. But what I started to recognize is that what separates an average story from an exceptional one is the willingness that we have to lean into something that has a considerable chance of defeating us. And so more specifically, I landed on what I like to call the 60-40 rule. Projects that have a 60% chance of success and a 40% chance of failure tend to produce our best work. I'd like to suggest that it's not just a philosophy for quality filmmaking, but for a supercharged life. Because as humans, we are programmed to take risks. And we're also rightly programmed to fear them. So how did I get to this 60-40 philosophy? By being tasked with a handful of absolutely outrageous tasks, like Dean Potter jumping off the top of Mount Butte and setting a world record for human flight, documenting Will Gadd being the first person to climb Niagara Falls, capturing a team of kayakers completing the first descent of the Barrowman River in Papua New Guinea, the deepest gorge in the South Pacific, And what all of these projects had in common was at some point, someone said they were impossible. Couldn't happen. But these impossible types of projects produced the best stories in films. And I'm interested in that line, that really thin line and margin for success versus failure. And you don't want to cross it. You never want to cross the line and fail. It's that you want to straddle it throughout the whole project where you're right on the line. Now, I developed an aptitude for risk-taking before I picked up my first camera. This is me dropping into a 30-foot waterfall in my backyard of Squamish, British Columbia, ironically named the 50-50. And some of you might be thinking, yeah, adrenaline junkie. But I prefer to think of this as risk-taking, calculated risk-taking. Whitewater kayaking requires you to be intensely focused in the moment. There's no, like, thinking about your emails or Instagram feeds when you're paddling into something like this. You're focused, not distracted, completely concentrated on that five-second period of time. It's not um, like a game where you respawn and try again. The stakes are real. You screw up, you die, and you don't come back. And so, you know, I started to realize through this sport that I learned, I think, to, deal, to live with a certain degree of mental and physical discomfort. And it gave me a tool set that I would take into my career in filmmaking. And it also inspired me to take a camera into these places that so few people see on the planet. I failed a lot trying to become a filmmaker. I didn't understand the breaking point of technology. I completely misjudged how hard it was to make money doing this. But I wasn't afraid to fail. And I was driven in the pursuit of a solid story. So I rigged up cable cams, and I came up with novel ideas. Uh, I tried to be different. But what I needed was someone to take that 60-40 bet on me. When National Geographic gave me a chance with The Man Who Could Fly, a story about Dean Potter, that was my defining moment. Like, I needed to succeed against all the obvious odds. It was a wild project a one-hour special for the National Geographic Channel with this amazing climber, highliner, and wingsuit pilot. He was a superhuman of sorts. Dean constantly turned the impossible to possible, and we had one of the biggest stages in the world to tell the story. The final scene of the film was at Mount Butte in British Columbia, a 9,000-foot granite monolith that Dean was going to climb and then wingsuit off the top. 
And we fought like hell to succeed here because we had everything that we needed for this film except an ending. And so without an ending, everything that we had done so far might just hit the cutting room floor. Dean climbed the wall, he got to the top, he made a quick assessment and said, I'm not comfortable jumping off. It doesn't look like it works. And you don't like distrust someone that has that kind of caliber of being able to judge risk. You're just like, okay, Dean's not going to jump. And I thought, it's over. I'm never going to work for National Geographic again. We don't have the ending. And what ensued was the craziest and most committed teamwork I've ever seen in my life. We built a ramp on the top of Mount Butte, a 40-foot structure that arched out over the top of the mountain to give Dean a chance to jump. When he jumped off that wall, I felt this just incredible responsibility to be holding a camera. He flew for three minutes, set a world record, and just like that, we had an ending to the film. But more importantly, Dean stretched my mind as to what we are capable of as human beings. Now, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey here. Um, we're going to go on one of these projects and sort of see how that 60-40 rule unfolds, like how to press past all the micro failures and keep it alive even when it feels like you're going to fail. This is Alaska, the tallest mountains in North America, wilderness ground zero. Adventurer Gavin McClurg had an idea. He wanted to paraglide across the entire length of the Alaska range. And everyone that I talked to and trusted about this said, the idea is batshit crazy. It's never going to work. The scale of it was staggering. 500 miles across one of the wildest mountain ranges in the world, past Denali National Park, Mount Hunter, Mount Foraker, and the tallest peaks in North America. And somehow we were going to need to chase this as it unfolded. No one had done anything like this before. But what was interesting, I think, is that Gavin kept bugging me about this over two years. We got to do this trip. We got to do this trip. And I think that's important because when it's someone's dream, not just an idea, it starts to become tangible. It's infectious. You believe in the dream. And so we set off. And to capture something like this, you need a small, well-oiled team with like zero light between you. This is what we looked like as the camera team. Three cinematographers, a photographer, and two of the world's best bush pilots. And here's what we looked like in the field. There's no catering trucks or four seasons on expeditions like this. And I thought we were as light as it gets. This is what Gavin and Dave were taking for a 30-day expedition. Like, the bare essentials. Because in paragliding, if you're too heavy, you literally fall out of the sky. So they had everything except for their food. They had cashed that prior to the expedition because they were going to do this entirely self-supported. What I could not get my head wrapped around, though, was how they were going to fly 500 miles across one of the most remote ranges in the world with effectively a bed sheet attached to some strings over their heads. That's it. The way paragliding works is you launch off a mountain, and you chase thermals, rising masses of air that can take you up to like 10,000 feet, and then you go on glide. On a really good day, you could go 100 miles. Gavin had a really simple theory. He was going to fly when the conditions were good, and then they would hike when the weather was bad. And that all sounds like great on paper, very simple. Day one, they got in the air. Like all the anxiety slipped away, and Gavin's theory was working. Day two, the reality set in. Oh. Flying conditions were poor, and it took him about three hours post holing through the snow to go one mile. But if there's one thing that I've learned as a filmmaker is that when people are suffering, you keep the camera rolling. It's entertaining. 
And so if you ever adopt the 60-40 rule, you have to remember that it's sliding constantly. Like most good 60-40s feel like 10-90s on inception. But you have to hold on to that 10% of success if you want your odds back. Now, weather forecast was horrendous. 15-day weather forecast of either high winds or rain. And Gavin kept telling me, it's fine, we'll just hike. But I'm thinking, I'm not here to film a backpacking expedition. I'm here to tell a story of human flight. And eventually they got in the air. And it really is one of the most spectacular things. Seeing as far as the eye can see, flying across the Alaska range, hanging from a bed sheet. The solution is simple. You put your head down and you keep going. You figure out a way. You figure out a way over the river. You figure out a way over the glacier. You figure out a way through the coal. And you just keep going. So it was working, sort of. I knew the big crux ahead was Denali National Park, where you can't legally launch or land a paraglider. And they'd have to make an 80-mile flight to get past the tallest mountains in North America. At this point, 50 miles was as far as they had flown on the entire trip. And so we're 20 days in, maybe a quarter of the way through the expedition. Morale's pretty low. Gavin and Dave are literally starving. They put the food caches way too far apart. And I'm thinking the flight across Denali is impossible. Then it starts snowing in June. And you definitely don't want to be the first person that breaks on a team, but I think we were all having internal dialogues about going home. Even Gavin, who is a chronic optimist, was questioning everything. And then the sun came out, and you could see Denali in the distance. And as a filmmaker, you wonder what's going to happen, because it's not my decision as to whether they go or not, and they go. They decide that they're going to make and attempt the flight across Denali. And I'm thinking of all those times that I heard batshit crazy. But these were the images that I'd always envisioned, a paraglider sailing across the tallest mountains in North America, something no one had done, let alone captured on film. So they take off, and we're capturing all of this from a helicopter with a gyro-stabilized gimbal, and getting the images that I had always dreamed of but it's silent inside the helicopter. Like, everyone can feel that we're on the knife edge. And then, all of a sudden, Gavin gets sucked into a cloud at like 10,000 feet. I am way in this cloud. You see anything? Got ice all over my wing, I gotta get out of this thing. Gavin, do you have a copy? I'm crossing Foraker River. Just flew in this cloud for the last 20 some minutes. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty cold. Totally iced up. And uh, but now I'm just coming out of it. And I gotta keep my wing flying because as it starts to melt, it's gonna wanna collapse. Failure to me in these environments is kind of this. It's when someone is about to get hurt, or worse, not come home. It's not about a missed shot. It's about real failure. And so it's really on that knife edge. I have no idea what's going on, whether or not they've made it across. And then all of a sudden, I start to get text messages on these DeLorms, these satellite communication devices that we use. They've landed, but I'm getting separate texts. I'm getting texts from Gavin and Dave. Dave says, I'm done, I'm going home, I'm over this. And Gavin's like, it was my dream, it was my project, I don't give a shit if Dave quits, I'm continuing on. And I'm thinking, okay, just like Top Gun, right? Never leave your wingman. Here we go. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer a director, I'm a psychologist, trying to like diffuse the situation, because we have a film to make here, and we need to finish it. So. Dave leaves, and I totally get it. He's put 30 days in, they achieve the goal of flying past the big three, he's done. Gavin says he's continuing on solo. My executive producer is calling me and saying, it's over, figure out a different way to finish the film. We're out of money, we're out of time, and Gavin's only a third of the way through a 500-mile traverse. So, 
I decide to gamble. And sometimes a credit card solves problems. So Gavin and I self-fund a small team to carry on with the expedition. And eventually, the sky's clear after 30 days of terrible weather, full high pressure, good luck finally comes our way. And Gavin completes two-thirds of that traverse in just five days with a few hundred-mile flights. He lands by himself, and there's no high fives or celebrations. It was just this huge emotional release. It was an ending that no one expected, and I think to date, one of my best pieces of work. <laughs> I think we earned that because we honored the story, and we stuck with it through all the ups and downs and emotions, trusting the process, and using micro successes to constantly counteract micro failures. Holding on every time when we only felt like there was a 10% chance for success. Immediately after these sort of expeditions, I always say, never again, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. And I have these moments of like, give up the field, take more predictable studio work. But I keep finding myself climbing back into the helicopter. And I think, why? Because it's these moments of living on the edge, pushing past what we think is impossible, that inspire us in ways that sure bets just simply cannot. I imagine many of you are holding on to a dream, maybe even thinking about it right now, waiting for a time where the odds for success feel much greater. Here's the invitation to take on a challenge that has a completely unknown outcome, likely even has a very high suffering coefficient, at some point it should feel like it sucks. That's how we evolve. Finding that thin margin for success keeps us curious and engaged in life. Do not be afraid to be afraid. Thank you.